Hello, and welcome to the Thyroid Warrior Podcast. I'm Ebony, and I'm here as your wellness facilitator. I'm going to be sharing my experiences in managing Hashimoto's disease. I really hope that it'll help you on your personal journey. Keep in mind, however, this does not substitute for medical advice. It is only for your information and motivational purposes only. Now, let's get started. Hello, everyone. I am so excited because remember we started talking about all of the updates and all of the fun things that we had coming. And I really wanted to do more in terms of focusing on heart health because that's essential from a thyroid perspective. And there are so many things that go into understanding our thyroid health, but we also need to make sure that we're approaching it from a full body perspective. So today we have Karen Lang on the show with us and I'm so excited because she is just amazing and I know you guys are going to enjoy her today. So welcome Karen, I'm so happy to have you here. Thanks so much Ebony, I really appreciate you having me today. Absolutely, so we are going to just jump right in with all of the knowledge that you have to share with us. So talk to me really briefly about how you ended up in this field and working as a heart health coach. Like, Talk to me a little bit more about that. Sure, I worked for years in a cardiac surgery ICU. I just fell in love with the heart and I kept thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could get all of these people before they had surgery. So then I started working in cardiac rehabilitation, which is an area where we work with people after they have surgery or after they find out they have heart disease. And I was helping people make lifestyle changes. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could get a hold of these people before they had the heart disease? And so that led me to pursue some further education and training and led me into being a lifestyle coach for people who want to decrease their risk for the development of heart disease. Oh, that is good. I love that. And I love your passion behind it. And speaking from personal experience, you know, when I was struggling with my thyroid disease initially, I had a lot of issues with heart palpitations and having to take beta blockers because of my heart and everything that I had going on. So could you talk to us a little bit more about just the importance of cardiovascular health? Sure, and cardiovascular health is important for all of us, not just those of us who are suffering currently with thyroid disorders, but it is the number one killer in the United States of both men and women. And sadly, the people keep getting younger and younger. Um, So that is part of why it's so important. And the other piece of it is at least 75% of chronic diseases are related to our lifestyle factors. So that Mm. sounds kind of depressing, but at the same time, it's good news because it means we may have more control than we think we do. That's awesome. That's really awesome. So talk to, talk to me a little bit more about those lifestyle things that, you know, we have control over. Okay. Well, uh, of course, as a cardiac nurse, you know, I've got to talk about smoking. <laughs> Absolutely. That is the number one thing that we can do to decrease our risk for heart disease. So there are a lot of resources out there currently. Um, you can call 1-800-QUIT-NOW or check out the American Lung Association website. Those are you know, just a couple of quick references for places that people that want to quit smoking can go to get some free help, which is great. But I always like to tell people to start with the basics. You know, people want to talk to me about chelation therapy and this supplement and that supplement or that medication. But... Let's start with the basics. Get enough sleep. Try to sleep seven to eight hours a night. Uh, Drink at least eight to ten glasses of water a day. And move at least 30 minutes, at least five days each week. That's a great place to get started. I love it. (laughs) And, And from a perspective of 
those basic things, I think that they're so important, especially when you're at an office job and it's really hard to get up and you become so glued to either your computer screen or your desk or you're back and forth between meetings. And I know personally, it drives me insane. Like I'm constantly moving at work because I can't sit still that long. So it's really difficult for me. But for someone else and my coworkers, that's often something that we talk a lot about is that sedent, more sedentary lifestyle in that type of setting and what we can do. And we've actually started like trying to challenge each other to drink more water and to get more sleep. And we're having and just different conversations about that and holding each other accountable. So I'm really glad that you mentioned those things. That's great. And it's interesting that you mentioned the uh, desk setting, you know, because so many people are working in an office. And we started out talking about smoking because you may have heard it said that sitting is the new smoking. Mm -hmm. And so many of us are inactive. And I always encourage people who do work in an office setting like that to set an alarm on their phone hourly. All you have to do is get up, walk around your desk, stretch. It will make a huge difference in your health outcomes. I definitely love that. I'm always walking around and <laughs> I have to be careful because sometimes I'll go in the stairway and I'll just walk the stairs and sometimes I might run up them to get my heart rate up and I end up scaring some of my coworkers. <laughs> but they forgive me. It's usually all good. So could you talk to me a little bit more about those of us who have thyroid conditions, let's say, what are some of those common signs that people overlook when they have a thyroid condition that may or may, well, may be associated with their heart? Sure. Um, some of the most common symptoms of uh thyroid condition are related to the heart and the cardiovascular system. So some of the things that it affects that you mentioned already, one of them was heart rate. It also affects our cholesterol levels and um, you can have rhythm irregularities, heart rate rhythm irregularities. So you may feel some funny beats now and then. Um, so those are a few of the big things that you might see. So you might think, you know, oh, I'm just stressed or I haven't had enough sleep or I need to drink more water or, um, you know, I have a family history of elevated cholesterol. And it may be a symptom of a thyroid disorder that hasn't been diagnosed yet or may have, may have been diagnosed, but they haven't related those things. Mm. Yeah, I know all about cholesterol. <laughs> um, so the exciting thing is it's usually reversible when the thyroid is treated. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the good news on that piece. Yeah, that's very exciting. I know last August, I, July or August, I went to the doctor for my yearly checkup. And my endocrinologist was talking to me about, you know, what I was doing in terms of my diet and how I was feeling. And we did our full blood workup and it came back that my TSH levels were elevated and then my cholesterol and my hemoglobin A1C was elevated. I was like, hmm, that's odd. You know, I'm, I consider myself to be very active and I walk a lot a day and then I was like okay I need to think about this a minute before I get really frustrated with the doctor and say ah oh, well she doesn't know what she's talking about let me just calm down think about it and go back so I actually went I started a food journal I started exercising more regularly and doing more than just walking and I realized that over time, like I had a very calcium rich diet, which in a lot of cases you think, oh, my joints and my bones and all that fun stuff. But because of my thyroid medication, I was eating it and a lot of those things very close to when I was taking my medication. So it started screwing with my thyroid levels and everything going on. And then the next thing I knew, I was like, I, I just, I need to keep monitoring things. So I changed my diet. I 
moved around what I had that was pretty high in calcium until about three to four hours after taking my meds. And my thyroid levels got cut in half. My cholesterol was down by like, I think 40 points. And it like, I got sleep. It was amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. It was, it was fantastic. So, you know, knowing that you might have those uh, cardiac arrhythmias or issues with your heart rate and all that fun stuff, when is it time to go see a cardiologist? Well, hopefully you're going to be treated by your primary care physician or primary care provider or endocrinologist. And maybe those cardi some of those cardiac symptoms that you might have that are directly related to your thyroid will resolve spontaneously. But, of course, anytime you have chest pain, shortness of breath, uh, anything like that, you're definitely going to want to follow up with a cardiologist any of those rhythm disturbances. So if you feel, you know, if you feel your pulse and you know that you're having these funny beats on a fairly regular basis, most of us have a funny beat every now and then. Mm -hmm. But if you know you're having those on a regular basis, that would be a time to go. Also, if you have any symptoms of heart failure, which this gets difficult because people that have, are hypothyroid may also have some similar symptoms. Um, you know, you feel really super tired. Um, you may have some shortness of breath. Swelling of your lower extremities is one of the symptoms or a really rapid weight gain. I know you can put on weight when you're hypothyroid, but this would be something where you notice, you know, you're putting on five pounds in two days, that oh. kind of thing. Oh my. Yeah, that's, that's pretty important. And it's, interesting because as I hear you talking about the different symptoms, I was like, oops. Oh yeah. I experienced that. I probably should have said something, but you know, I was at the doctor so much. They're like, eh, you're just, you're, 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 you're meh, I don't know. <laughs> you have so much going on. Let's just test for everything. But that's right. really, really great that you brought up those symptoms because a lot of times people will tell you, oh, you're just stressed out, you know, just go relax, go, you know, right. chill out. And it's, it's really great that you can easily pinpoint and talk about those symptoms because it's, it's just really important. And I just love that we're talking about this. I have to say, this is like one of those things that's really near and dear to my heart. Absolutely. And it is, it is important to report those symptoms and follow up. And I do always like to start out with a primary care provider. You know, I love cardiologists. I, you know, have a passion for this, but they are heart focused. And so it's really good to start out with your primary care provider or your endocrinologist who's kind of looking at the whole picture, mm -hmm. which is, which is really important as well. And, you know, I'm not talking, when I say shortness of breath, I'm not talking about, you know, one morning you felt short of breath going up the stairs. It, you know, something that becomes a pattern or mm -hmm. something that you experience over a period of time. Got it. That's awesome. So earlier you mentioned cholesterol and all that fun stuff. Could you kind of talk about when it comes to cholesterol, what are some of those things that you should look out for? Because for me, for example, I just got to a point where I'm like, okay, I understand the difference between HDL and LDL and my triglycerides. And so could you just kind of break down what those things mean? And if I have elevated cholesterol levels, what are some of the things that someone should look out for? Okay. Well, the first thing is make sure you get it checked. Because mm -hmm. not everybody does, and we can't make any positive changes if we don't know where we stand. Right. So that's the first thing. And then as you pointed out, you also need to know more than just your total number. And there are a lot of people walking around that that's all they know. If mm -hmm. I'm under 200, I'm good. Well, right. that's not necessarily true. Um, the HDL, which has historically been referred to as the good cholesterol, um, has been seen as the garbage truck which kind of goes around and picks up the LDL. Mm. They're, 
they're finding that there actually may be different types of HCL, so that may not be completely true, but generally that, that's the case. Um, so we generally want that HDL to be higher. Mm -hmm. There are some people who have a family history of lower HDLs, and so it's important to know what yours is. HDL does not respond very well to changes in diet. HDL responds to quitting smoking, mm -hmm. losing weight, and increasing your physical activity. Got That's it. how ways to bring up your HDL. And there's some things that suggest red wine, but we never suggest starting to drink <laughs> red <it> already. <laughs> yeah. Um, the LDL, or the one that we think of as bad, um, is the one that is considered primarily responsible for laying down your plaque. So that is the one that they really focus on. Your primary care doctor or the cardiologist would focus on that level, and that's the one that they they really like to know. We can, I'm going to mention something else later. We can talk about a little differences between LDL. Mm -hmm. Um, and then triglycerides. Triglycerides is a type of, uh, it's a way that fat and sugar are carried around in the blood. And so that, that's important, especially for people that have a family history of diabetes or know that they have diabetes. Uh, it, the good news about triglycerides is it's the one that responds most easily to changes in your diet. Oh. So it responds well to decreases in simple sugars. So things like uh, white bread, cakes, cookies, uh, that alcohol that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, changing those, taking that out of your diet and uh, replacing that with complex carbohydrates, uh, whole grains, and eating the whole fruit instead of drinking the juice, things like that uh, are ways to bring those triglycerides down. And the LDL that we were talking about earlier, that, that really responds well to decreasing the saturated fats in your diet. So saturated fats are the ones that are generally found in animal products, not in plant products. There mm -hmm. are some in some plant products, but not definitely not as many as in animal products. So if you have a family history of abnormal cholesterols, whether it's abnormally high LDL or triglycerides or abnormally low HDL, it is important to talk with your doctor about advanced lipid testing. Mm. And what they have found, we were talking about that LDL earlier and how it lays down the plaque. It's the one that's primarily responsible for that. Mm -hmm. What they have found is that there are actually different types of LDL. So when you and I get our lipid profile done at our primary care, we usually get our total, our HDL, our LDL, and our triglycerides. And usually they'll tell us, you know, if you're under 100 for your LDL, you're looking good. Mm -hmm. That is a volume number. It's milligrams per deciliter. So let's ah. say you and I both have an LDL of 100. I'm going to convert that into saying you and I have a cup. Right. LDL, just to make the volume thing easier to understand. And let's say that you have what we call large, fluffy LDLs. There are going to be fewer LDL particles in your cup than there are in mine because I have small, dense LDLs. So if I have smaller ones, I can fit more of them into my cup. So even though we both had an LDL of 100, we may be at different risk for developing heart disease. Oh. So if you have a family history of uh, heart disease, especially if you have a family history of abnormal cholesterol, it's definitely a conversation to have with your doctor about having that done. And it, it typically you can have it done at a time you and you would have your cholesterol checked and your insurance will cover that. Mm. Wow. <laughs> I definitely just learned something new because I I wasn't even thinking about that. And it's funny because as much research as I've done on it, that just didn't even come up. 
So (laughs) I'm excited. I hope you listeners are very excited because this is like juicy information here. It's, it's good stuff. So, okay. So we have all this, we have the big picture. We have our HDL and LDL and triglycerides and all of the wonderful things that go into making us healthy and making our heart function and all that fun stuff. So now I'm standing here, right? And I'm new to all of this and I'm trying to make sure that I'm taking care of myself and I want to move forward. What are some of your recommendations for getting in the groove of that or maintaining your cardiovascular health? Sure. Well, one thing, um, especially as we were talking about the cholesterol levels, if your thyroid levels are out of whack, as you were talking about in your experience earlier, and your cholesterol levels are also out of whack, please don't jump straight to medication. Mm -hmm. Start out with lifestyle measures. Um, You know, heart healthy diet, keeping your ideal body weight, exercise, all those things while you're working to get your thyroid levels back where they should be. So we don't want to treat one thing that's being caused by something different. Got it. Um, one important thing that I always encourage people when you're, when you're looking at that heart healthy lifestyle, one thing is also to know what your family history is because it gives you more motivation Mm -hmm. for how you may want to care for yourself the more you know how at risk you may be because of your family history. Sometimes those conversations are difficult to have, but, you know, if it's something that you don't already know, I encourage you to have those conversations so you are armed with that information. And that can be a motivation, absolutely. Um. Knowing your numbers, like we talked about before, cholesterol, your fasting, blood glucose, your blood pressure, all those things. Also, sometimes we're afraid to go get those, but Mm -hmm. they can also be motivating because I may think that I'm fine because I feel okay, but if I find out my levels are out of whack, that may be something that that gives me the motivation to make some changes because I've got a number on a paper and I can measure my progress. Yeah. Um, the heart healthy diet, I think we're going to talk about diet a little bit later and how we can make some changes there. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the really important things is managing daily stress because it's really hard to put anything into practice. If we're under stress, if we're not in a good place mentally, it affects us physically. So we talked earlier about getting enough sleep and movement. And those are both really key pieces. But there are simple things that you can do that don't take any time. Even for people that work at a desk, um, I always encourage people, we call them blue dots. And you take those little round office dots that you might price things for a yard sale with. Mm -hmm. And you put a few of those around, maybe three or four or five of those around where you experience stress throughout the day. Might be on your telephone your computer screen, the dashboard of your car, and it's a visual cue to remind you to stop and take a deep breath. Ooh, I like that. (laughs) It it takes very little time. But uh, one thing you probably already know because you've done so much research is when we are under stress, we have a tendency to breathe more shallowly. And You take a brain that's already under stress and you give it less oxygen. Well, it gets anxious and it gets more stress. So just that little habit of taking those deep breaths throughout the day can really help our mental outlook and help us end the day feeling less stress. So you were asking about how to stay motivated and keep going forward. Um, But some of those little things, those little practices that you put into place can really help change your outlook. Wow, that was that was really great to hear because so often we think that we have to do these monumental things in order to feel better and change things when it's really simple and it's really small. My friend has an Apple Watch and 
it monitors her heart rate and sometimes it'll buzz and it'll say breathe. And I think that that is so cool. Or on my Garmin watch, if I'm sitting too long, it vibrates. Awesome. So I'm like, oh, oh, wait, okay, I got to get up. I got to get up. I'll be right back. You know, like my coworkers are like, you are notorious for if you've been sitting too long or we're talking and all of a sudden, like, it's like it shocks me because partially because it scares me. So (laughs) I have to like pay attention to what just happened. And it, it really does. It forces me to get up and walk around. And while I'm walking, I try to take some deep breaths. Or if I get really stressed on a call, I gotten into the habit of looking down at my watch that has a heart rate monitor on it. And I pay more attention to it so that I can remind myself it's going to be okay. Just relax. Everything will be fine. And that process and that feedback mechanism really does help so i'm really glad you mentioned those then do you see your heart rate decrease as you're doing that yeah i do it's awesome yes yeah because in working in cardiac rehabilitation we have people on monitors while they're exercising and after exercise their heart rate has to come back down within a 10 beat window of where it was when they came in Mm -hmm. and they'll they'll be really frustrated wanting to leave and we'll tell them to sit close your eyes and take some deep breaths and you just watch that heart rate on the monitor just go right down yeah i've even started doing meditation and yoga and Mm -hmm. it has been a game changer for me and it's very difficult for me to sit still in my thoughts. So practicing that has really helped me to just focus on what's really important in that moment. And that's just being and not trying to worry about, okay, what am I going to do later? What am I going to do five minutes from now? Oh, wait, I have to go to the bathroom. But when I go to the bathroom, I have to talk to this person and that person and do this and do that. And oh, once I get home, I got no, it just calms me down and helps me to stay in the here and now and nothing else. That's awesome. One of the tools that I use a lot is uh, Cleveland Clinic has an app called Stress Free Now, and there are multiple meditations that you can use on there. But personally, I use the morning and evening breath, breathing ones. And so first thing, as soon as my alarm goes off, I will pop my earbuds in and do 10 minutes of breathing. And Right as I'm going to bed, I do 10 minutes of breathing. And I may be exhausted when I'm going to bed, and I think I don't need to do it tonight. It'll be fine. I'm going to go right to sleep. But I don't sleep as well during the night if oh, I don't do that first. That's really interesting. Hmm. I need to try that tonight because as soon as my head hits the pillow, I'm out. <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to try that tonight, as a matter of fact, and I'll let you know how it goes. Awesome. Well, another thing that I'd like to mention is a lot of times my clients are overwhelmed with the number of things that they feel that they need to change. And that makes it really difficult because if I feel like I need to lose 25 pounds and I'm not doing any physical activity currently and, you know, I'm I'm eating cupcakes for, for lunch or whatever it is, you know, oh, man, I just I don't even know where to start. So they become paralyzed because if we're all trying to do the best we can and if we can't do it right we really don't want to do it at all nope so lots of times having an outside person to help you focus and figure out what's the most important thing to start with and encouraging you to do that one thing and be successful in that one area first can really make all the difference i love that thank you for bringing that up it, it's, it, it honestly, having an accountability buddy has been one of the best decisions that I've made because we talk every Wednesday at eight o'clock at night and we go over what went well in the week, what didn't go well, how are you doing at work, how are you doing in your personal life, how is exercise going, how are you feeling, and it's such a cleansing conversation to have 
but it really keeps me on my toes because I'm like, oh, wait, I'm going to talk to her tonight. Let me make sure that, wait, yeah. did I exercise this week? Wait, did I eat right? Wait. <laughs> yeah. It's really good. Yes, you're exact. You're talking about exactly what I do with my clients. I always say it's a threefold process. We focus, I encourage, and I hold them accountable, which is exactly what your buddy's doing for you, helping you to focus, definitely encouraging you and holding you accountable because you know if you don't do it, you're going to have to fess up to it. And we are so much more likely to cheat on ourselves than we are if we're doing it with somebody else. Yeah. There were a couple times I was like, so I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And it felt horrible. But, you know, when I would not work out a day when it was just me, I'm like, meh, I'll catch up tomorrow. Yeah. But it, <laughs> it's so fun. I really love it. I really do. So along those lines, and when you work with your clients and when you go through things with them, what are some of the biggest, like, aha moments for them in terms of being able to just enhance their cardiovascular health? The first thing I would say is control. When someone finds out their cholesterol levels are high or they're diagnosed with diabetes, actually do something yourself to greatly decrease that risk. And that's even if you have a strong family history of heart disease. So feeling like you're not, you know, you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop, um, it really helps them to feel, okay, I, I can do something about this. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would say is um, making the changes now because I had, uh, there's one guy that I will never forget who, uh, he had had a heart attack and I worked with him for a year. And after that, he said to me, I feel better now than I did before the heart attack because wow. I always meant to, to make those changes someday. And he was really the inspiration for me starting this business because I was like, why should we have to wait for the heart attack? Mm -hmm. So, you know, recognizing that they need to make the changes now and, and taking those actions to be in control, um, they just really inspire me in that way. Wow. That's Oh, that just makes me so happy to hear. It it just fills my cup. I love it. So we're talking about making changes and doing things one step at a time. So what are some heart healthy foods that you personally recommend? Well, we've blamed fat for heart disease for a really long time now, and that's still important. But the research is showing us that refined sugar plays a significant role in inflammation, mm -hmm. which plays a huge role in the development of heart disease and other diseases, of course. Right. So uh, you're, you're asking what food I'd recommend, but the first thing i got to say is limit the amount of refined sugars in your diet. And as you're probably aware, sugar is hiding in a crazy number of prepared foods. So be a label reader. Uh, even with things that you might think are health foods, like, you know, healthy granola bars and cereals and pasta sauces, things like that. So keep it simple. Uh, prepare your own foods. Shop around the outside of the store. Frozen is good. You don't have to. It doesn't have to be fresh food. Um, of course, fresh, local and organic is ideal. But, you know, that the environmental working group, you know, look out for that dirty dozen and the clean 15 mm -hmm. uh, to know which things are really important to buy organic and which things are not as important. Um, and keep it colorful. And I don't mean trick cereal either. You know? <laughs> so just it, it doesn't have to be really um, difficult. You know, it just keep, keep it simple. We, we are, habit you know we're just uh we we have formed these habits and the changes moving from one place to another is the difficult part mm -hmm. that transition but just start with one day a week you know if right now your diet is horrible don't overhaul the whole thing just start with one day a week and once you got that down add a second day and so forth that's the way changes 
that laughs are made, most of us, some people can can do a total overhaul and do well that way. But the majority of us, we're, we're much better if we do it in baby steps. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Wholeheartedly. I'm so glad you mentioned that in terms of taking baby steps and really just focusing on, let's think about the rainbow, shop the periphery of the store, the, the sugar. I have to catch myself because I can very easily go off on a tangent about the healthy granola bars and the protein bars. And what really just like almost made me fall on the floor is once I started paying more attention to how much sugar was in things, it was incredible. Like 12 grams of sugar in yogurt in a small container, 16 grams of sugar in a a protein bar. And I was like, wait a minute, what? They have us addicted. I, I just, I, I... I mean, sugar in your spaghetti sauce and like 20 grams of that. I'm like, oh my goodness, (laughs) this is horrible. It's crazy. And now like my husband and I, he has osteoarthritis and we have such an interesting diet. And it's not interesting interesting in the sense of we eat crazy foods, but we've literally developed a system of mostly plants, but protein, clean protein when possible, and making sure that we have all of the foods that help to fight against inflammation and, you know, really shopping the outside of the aisles when I go. Like we sit down, we meal plan together, we sort out our grocery list. And that took time, like when we were dating, I would send him home with a week's worth of food that he would be done with in two days. But, you know, it was those baby steps. And that took maybe a year of doing that before he was like, ah, okay, I I guess I believe you. But he started, his skin started to clear. He wasn't wheezing as much from his asthma. He started feeling a lot better. He started losing weight really quickly, which was really good for his hip. And it it was it was insane. And now, you know, we're trying this no added sugar t- in terms of our diet. So I literally can stand in the grocery store for what feels like ever just reading the labels. I'm like, if I can't pronounce it, I'm not eating it. Right. Right. And here we think this is a whole new thing we've come up with. And Hippocrates was the one that said food should be our medicine. Right. right? It's it's insane. And I just love how I feel after I eat, like anyone that knows me knows how much I love food. But when I can research and say, okay, this is going to help me with this. and This is going to help me with that. And ooh, how do I combine these two to get added benefits? And oh, maybe I should do this. Or like, even when I juice, I don't toss out the fiber from it. I dump everything into the blender and I incorporate all that fiber back in there because I want the good stuff. Give me all of it. And I don't want my blood sugar to spike as a result of just drinking the juice. So it's it's been such an amazing journey to look back and see where I was before and where I am now. And I feel like a completely different person. Right. I think you mentioned a really important thing in there, too, is you paid attention to how you felt after you ate. We know sometimes we eat stuff and we feel bad afterwards. So if you pay attention and say, you know what, when I eat this way, I feel really good. It's not just that you're doing it because you read somewhere in a journal that it was good for you. You're doing it because you actually feel better right now. Yeah, I wouldn't trade all of this energy that I have right now for the world. Like, I would be in bed for at least 14 hours because I couldn't move. I was having that shortness of breath whenever I walked around. I couldn't climb two flights of stairs without being significantly winded and just being so lethargic and not really being able to move. And 
to look back at that and see where I was there to seeing, you know, I'm training super heavy and I'm going to start sprinting again. Awesome. It, it makes me want to cry. And I try really hard not to get really emotional, but it's just, it's such a beautiful thing to see that progression. That's fantastic. What a witness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the tears are coming. So before they actually come, <laughs> So if, let's say, the folks that are listening want to get in touch with you, how do we do that? How do, where do we find you? Well, you can visit me on my website. Learn a little bit more about me there at Karen Lang, K-A-R-E-N-L-A-I-N-G dot net. And uh, there you'll find a out a little bit more about me as well as I have a video workbook bundle there. If you want to kind of get a hold of that focus that we talked about, it goes through all the risk factors associated with heart disease. It kind of gives you an idea of where you should start because you need to keep track of where you are, make sure you have all the information you need to assess your risk currently mm -hmm. and decide where the first step is to go. I also work with clients one-on-one, -on -one, so my co individual coaching services are listed on there as well. Awesome sauce. And she's also on Facebook. It's All Heart Coaching, right? Yes. Awesome. And All Heart Coach on Twitter. Correct. I love it. I'm so excited and I'm so grateful that you came on the show today and that you talk through all of the different risk factors and things that we should really think about when it comes to cardiovascular health. And do you have any parting words to share with us today? Well, thank you so much, Ebony, for having me today. I just love your passion over you want to share all this that has helped you to feel better. And I know that you and I are coming together. We're looking at different parts of the body, but our goal is the same, to help everybody feel better in the end. Um, and so I just I want to thank you for the opportunity to share and uh, talk to your audience today. Thank you. Oh, okay. I said the tears weren't going to come. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> They're already here. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm in a room by myself, so no one gets to see my ugly tears. So it's fine. So Karen, I know you said that you had something very special for our listeners today. Did you want to kind of talk a little bit more about that? Thanks, Ebony. Um, I mentioned that I have a video workbook bundle and that I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with individual clients. And I would like to make a special offer to your listeners with the coupon code WARRIOR, W-A-R-R-I-O-R. -R -R. They can get 20% off the video workbook bundle or any one-on-one -on -one appointment. Ooh, that's exciting, guys. So if you have not done so already... If you're driving, don't do it. But go ahead and head over to Karen's website at karenlang.net and make sure you can purchase that bundle she has. I love it. It's great. It had a lot of wonderful information in it that I actually already started <laughs> documenting in because I'm going to get my biometric screening soon. So guys, hurry up. Go ahead and do that for your 20% off. And I'll definitely make sure that I include that information in the show notes for this particular episode. So with that, I'm so grateful that you were able to come on, Karen. And for all of my thigh warriors out there, I hope that you stay well, be healthy, and be whole. And I will talk to you soon. Take care. Okay, thyroid warriors. Get out there and take things one step at a time. Remember, be great, reflect on your triumphs, and as always, be well. Take care.